Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors in the David Berkowitz case. David Berkowitz is also known as the son of Sam and the 44 caliber killer. He was a serial killer who was active in New York City in 1976 and 1977. The people I'll be talking about in this video, of course, are real, so just a reminder I'm not diagnosing anybody, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. So first I'll look at the timeline of the criminal activity in this case, then the background of David Berkowitz, and then look at the mental health and personality factors. So starting with the timeline, we see this case starts on July 29, 1976, in the Bronx, New York. Two women, age 18 and 19, are shot while they're sitting in their car. Berkowitz quickly approached the car carrying a 44 caliber handgun, and just after 1 p.m., he fired his weapon and ran away. The 18-year-old died after being hit once in the neck. The 19-year-old would survive after being shot once in the hip. Moving to October 23, 1976, Queens, New York, we see that Berkowitz fires shots at a 20-year-old man and an 18-year-old woman who were sitting in a parked car. He injured both occupants, but they both survived. November 27, 1976, two females, age 16 and 18, were talking on the porch of the 18-year-old's residence in Queens shortly after midnight. Berkowitz approached them and asked for directions. Before he finished asking, he produced a 44 caliber revolver and shot each of them once. Both survived. The 18-year-old was paralyzed from the waist down. January 30, 1977. Now all of the remaining crimes will occur in 1977. At 12.40 a.m., we see a 30-year-old man and a 26-year-old woman were sitting in a car in Queens. Berkowitz fires multiple shots into the car. The 26-year-old is hit twice, she dies a few hours later, and the 30-year-old man survives. March 8, 7.30 p.m. in Queens, Berkowitz shoots a 19-year-old woman in the head as she was walking home from school. She was killed instantly. April 17, 3 a.m. in the Bronx, we see... A 20-year-old man and an 18-year-old woman were shot by Berkowitz when sitting in the woman's car. Both were killed. Berkowitz left a note in the street near these victims. It was really a disorganized and incoherent letter, but in it he identifies himself as the son of Sam. On May 30, we see that another letter is written, and this one goes to the New York Daily News, also really disorganized and incoherent. June 26, 3 a.m., Queens, New York. A 20-year-old male and a 17-year-old female are sitting in the man's car. Berkowitz fires into the vehicle, injuring both of them. Both would survive. July 31, Brooklyn, New York. Sometime after 2.30 a.m., a man and a woman, both aged 20, are shot by Berkowitz as they are sitting in the man's car. The woman died. The man was seriously and permanently injured. During that same morning, again July 31, just before the shooting, a 49-year-old woman was walking her dog and was approached by a young man who was holding his arm stiffly, like he had something up his sleeve. She also said that this man walked like a cat. The man made eye contact with her as he passed by. Just after this, she heard gunshots. Later, when she was recalling this story to the police, she remembered that she had seen a police officer putting a ticket on a car parked in front of a fire hydrant, just one block from where that murder occurred. The police collected all the information about cars that were given a ticket that night. One of the cars was a yellow 1970 Ford Galaxy. It was registered to David Berkowitz. The police found the car on August 10, and they noticed a rifle in the back seat. They searched the car, and they found a threatening letter to a police officer and a map indicating the locations of the attacks. They waited for Berkowitz, and they confronted him. Berkowitz was carrying a bag containing a 44 caliber revolver. On August 11, Berkowitz confesses to all of the attacks. Now, the police reported from the interviews with Berkowitz that Berkowitz said that his neighbor, a man named Sam Carr, had a black Labrador retriever and that this dog was possessed by a demon that was giving orders to Berkowitz. Now, Berkowitz has disputed this claim, and I'll talk about that when I get to the mental health and personality section. Now moving to May 8, 1978, we see that Berkowitz pleads guilty and is sentenced to 25 years to life for each of the six murders that he committed. Now even though the sentences were consecutive, Berkowitz is still technically eligible for parole, 
after 25 years. So he's actually had a few different parole hearings at the time that I'm making this video. So we see that in total, Berkowitz killed six people and injured seven others. So now moving to his background. David Berkowitz was born Richard David Falco on June 1st, 1953 in Brooklyn, New York. Within two weeks of his birth, he was adopted by Nathan and Pearl Berkowitz. This was planned in advance, right? So the couple that had him knew that they were going to give him up for adoption. His name was changed to Richard David Berkowitz, and he was raised in the Bronx. So as I go through a lot of his childhood events, we see a lot of unusual things happen to David. When he was five, his adopted mother took him to the Shore Haven Beach Club. His mother bathed him in the shower while other naked women were in there as well. At age seven, several things happened to him. He was given an intelligence test. His IQ was recorded as 118, so over a standard deviation above the mean, so fairly intelligent. He was hit by a car and sustained a head injury. A few months later, he suffered another head injury after running into a wall. His parents tell him that he's adopted, again, this is age seven, and they told him that his mother died in childbirth. Later, Berkowitz said that this had a major impact on him because he felt guilty that somehow maybe he caused his mother's death. He doesn't blame his adoptive parents for this message. He blames the mental health professionals because evidently this is the advice they gave to his adoptive parents to tell him that his birth mother had died. In 1961, at age eight, he sustains another head injury after getting hit in the head with a pipe. Age 10, this would be 1963, this was also a busy year, Berkowitz starts to get teased in school for being overweight, yet the neighbors describe him as violent. He becomes a bully. He's also described as a loner. He witnesses a mother and daughter die instantly after being struck by an automobile. He gets bit by a dog, and sometime around this time, he starts receiving mental health therapy every Saturday afternoon. This therapy was mandated by the schools. If he didn't see a therapist, he was going to be kicked out of school. Age 11, we see teachers describe him as easily angered and moody. And of course, we saw some of this before because he was ordered to go see a therapist. In 1965, at age 12, Berkowitz starts to set fires. At age 13, he feeds small doses of a cleaning fluid to his mother's parakeet over a three-week time period. The bird eventually dies. He witnesses another death. He sees a boy fall from a bus. This must have been like the most dangerous neighborhood anywhere. As I was reading this report, it's amazing how many bad things happened to him, and he's only 13 at this point. October 5, 1967, his adoptive mother, Pearl, dies from breast cancer. Berkowitz starts failing in school. Now we move to 1970. Berkowitz starts committing crimes more frequently. He tortures small animals. He continues to set fires. He breaks car windows and commits various acts of vandalism. 1971, at age 18, he graduates from high school and enlists in the Army. He serves in Korea. Now, he had some problems in the Army, like stealing food and being late. However, for the most part, he seemed to do okay there. He was honorably discharged in June of 1974. Now, just prior to his discharge, he started setting fires again. He actually kept a journal with all of the fires he started. At this point, here in 1974, he was up to 1,411 different fires. Also in 1974, he starts working in New York. He has a number of jobs there before ending up at the Postal Service in 1976. On his first job, after getting out of the Army, he was a security guard and got bit by a guard dog. At another job, he was a security guard at the JFK airport. He reports that dogs are talking to him while he's working. 1975, at age 22, he starts setting even more fires. In December of 1975, he sets his last fire. His total number of fires was 1,488, according to his log. April 1976, he moves into an apartment. One of his neighbors is a 63-year-old retiree named Sam Carr. In June of 1976, he buys a 44 caliber Charter Arms Bulldog revolver. This is a five-shot revolver. It's chambered for a 44 Special, not a 44 Magnum. So a lot of people think he used a 44 Magnum because that's what they think of when they hear 44 as part of a caliber. But there is another cartridge, a 44 Special, which is less powerful. 
So it was at this point where he started the shootings. He was 23 years old at this time. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors that might be applicable to a case like this. We see a lot of unusual behavior in addition to the actual attacks that he committed. He wrote a number of poems and letters. One poem that we see just after the first shooting is called Mother of Satan. Clearly, we see Berkowitz is into Satanism. His neighbor, Sam Carr, received a letter in April of 1977 complaining about his Labrador retriever. This letter was signed, A Citizen. He sent another letter to Sam Carr, threatening him. Sam went to the police at this time. After this, we see that Berkowitz even shoots Sam's dog, Harvey. The dog survived. In June 1977, he sent two threatening letters to his downstairs neighbor, and he set a fire on his front door in August, just before his arrest. So during this time, we see that Berkowitz said that he had been hypnotized by a demon. He was under the spell of a demon. Based on everything we see he did here, there does seem to be some loss of contact with reality. Now, after he was arrested, he was diagnosed with psychopathic personality with malingering, meaning he was faking some other symptoms. And they also added comorbid, paranoid, and hysterical traits. Other mental health professionals suspected he had paranoid schizophrenia. Now, after he was arrested, his intelligence was tested again. And this time, his IQ was recorded as 115. So exactly one standard deviation above the mean, and only three points lower than what we saw when he was seven. 1979, it was reported that he admitted that he made up the story about his neighbor's dog, telling him what to do. Now, interestingly, Berkowitz denies that he ever said the dog was talking to him. He has claimed since that he meant a demon that he referred to as Sam told him to commit the murders. So he's not saying that no one was talking to him. He's saying that someone was, but it was not the dog. Now, later he reported that he killed because he had resentment toward his mother and he had an inability to establish good relationships with women. So what was the real reason that Berkowitz committed the murders? Was it psychosis, paranoia, a bad relationship with his mother? What was really happening? Well, there's no way to know for sure, but it appears that his motive, like so many other serial killers, was to satisfy sexual desires. Killing was erotic to him. He was fascinated by the feelings of control and domination. He had a number of fantasies about the murders. He enjoyed the feeling of stalking people. On nights when he couldn't find a victim, he would sometimes go to previous crime scenes, and he even unsuccessfully tried to find the grave sites of some of his victims. So if Berkowitz didn't have schizophrenia, and he wasn't psychotic, and his motive was really domination, what was going on in terms of mental health? Well, I'm not sure that he wasn't psychotic, and I'll talk about that in a few moments. We see his behavior does seem to align with antisocial personality pathology. So antisocial personality disorder is a cluster B personality disorder in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM. It has seven symptom criteria, three of which are required for a diagnosis. We see repeated unlawful behaviors. This one seems to align with his behavior. Consistent deceitfulness. This one matches. Next criterion is impulsivity and poor planning. This one also seems clear. He drove his own car to the murder site. It was registered in his name, and he left his license plate on the car. On top of that, he parked in front of a fire hydrant. So we can see he wasn't going to win Master Criminal of the Year here, right? He was quite impulsive. Next symptom is aggressiveness and physical fights. We see from a early age, he was a bully. The next symptom is a reckless disregard for safety. Murder counts as a reckless disregard for safety. We see consistent irresponsibility. That one seems clear. And a lack of remorse. That one also seems clear. So one could make a good argument for an alignment of all seven of these symptom criteria. And of course, he did appear to have conduct disorder symptoms before the age of 15. This is another criterion for this disorder. So what about the idea that he was paranoid? This came up repeatedly when he was evaluated. Well, there did seem to be some paranoia in his behavior, but it really seemed, I think, more psychotic. Like it could have been paranoia tied in with psychosis. So that really brings me back to the discussion on psychosis. Many mental health professionals have dismissed this theory. They say that David Berkowitz had no psychosis in the past at all. Well, I think he could have had something like 
brief psychotic disorder or delusional disorder, but in the interviews we saw after he's already in prison, he does not seem to be psychotic, right? So I can see their point. When we see these interviews, there's not much going on. But if we look at his behavior and all the talk about him communicating with demons and things like that, that does seem to indicate some break from reality. I think a lot of the time when mental health clinicians see psychosis, they think of a disorder that has to stay around a long time, something like schizophrenia that does not tend to resolve on its own. And even with treatment, a lot of the time, the psychotic symptoms do stay around to some degree. But there are other disorders like brief psychotic disorder or delusional disorder, like I mentioned, that could have been affecting him and then could have resolved over time. So what caused Berkowitz to become a serial killer? It's interesting, Berkowitz had a lot in common with other famous serial killers. We see a similar pattern. He had a stressful childhood without proper supervision. He saw no serious penalties for his criminal behavior. We see a dysfunctional relationship with his mother. This is exceedingly common. We see this with other serial killers like Ed Kemper, Gary Ridgway, Henry Lee Lucas, and Richard Kukensky. We see he had difficulty establishing relationships with women. This is also common. We've seen this in Joel Rifkin, Ted Bundy, and Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. Berkowitz sustained multiple head injuries, like Richard Ramirez did. And we see two of the three risk factors of the MacDonald triad. So torturing small animals and fire setting. The third factor he doesn't seem to have, that was bedwetting. He also committed an attack in December of 1975. He attacked two women with a knife. He was never charged for this. This is also fairly common, starting out with a non-lethal attack or an attack that doesn't fit the pattern that emerges later. Like serial killers have to find their style. They have to kind of build confidence and figure things out. And perhaps we saw this with Berkowitz as well. I do think that in this attack, he did intend to kill them, right? So I think it's just a matter of a different method. He was using a knife instead of that 44 caliber revolver. So overall, Berkowitz wasn't really different than many other serial killers. Looking at his history and looking at what he did, they're actually fairly consistent. Areas where he's a little bit different than other serial killers would include his use of a firearm. Many serial killers do not use a firearm because they're loud and draw attention. We see no physical contact with the victims. As far as we know, he didn't touch any of the victims. He shot them and ran away. Another unusual factor with Berkowitz is he would attack two people at a time. That was pretty common for him. Not always, but that was common. Most serial killers attack one victim at a time. So some other unusual factors here when talking about Berkowitz. He's a fairly interesting serial killer. We see that the whole debate over psychosis, which I talked about, really kind of was a controversy in the mental health treatment community. A lot of people had a lot of theories. It really just goes to show that it can be hard to figure out if somebody's actually psychotic. And mental health professionals are often dependent on self-report. At the time of making this video, we see that Berkowitz is represented as a model prisoner. He refers to himself as the son of Hope, as opposed to the son of Sam. He has not sought release from prison. He even asked that his mandatory parole hearings be canceled. So according to New York law, he has to get a parole hearing every two years. And he doesn't want them. He doesn't want to seek any type of release. He says he's thinking not of himself, but of the victims. I don't think there's any chance of him getting out of prison, and he shouldn't get out. But it does appear like he is doing his best to be productive at this point in his life. It leads me to believe that if somebody could have effectively intervened earlier, before he committed the shootings, his progression to murder may have stopped. Although, sadly, he did go to therapy for a while, like I mentioned, and it didn't help him at all. So, even when mental health clinicians are involved, that doesn't necessarily mean that they can help somebody to avoid problems like we see with Berkowitz. Again, I think that's quite sad because the clinician was there and trying to help him, but something went wrong. I don't know if it was non-compliance. I don't know if it was a clinician who was not competent. I don't know what happened, but it really is quite worrisome that somebody could be in therapy. I think it was for a year or two and still go on to do what he did. Like so many serial killers, society missed many opportunities to intervene in any meaningful way before it was too late. 
I know whenever I talk about topics like serial killers, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.